Again, happy Wednesday. Good to see everybody live stream, YouTube, and wherever else this is going. We bless you and so grateful for what the Lord is doing. Revelation Road teaching. Uh, I don't know what number this is, but the last time we got together it was part three of uh, chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11. So we've been really, uh, we, you can tell we're really moving along fast. <clears throat> Not really. Uh, <laughs> part what? Part 56. We may break the record from the last time I taught this. So uh, if we put the rapture uh, teaching I did right before this, that would be really out of the ballpark. And, uh, but I hope it's a blessing to you. I hope you're learning something and seeing something you never saw before. That's the power of teaching and, and, and studying and researching for yourself is to come to a new revelation. Revelation always breeds revelation. One of the greatest tragedies for denominations and organizations that have been in existence 50, 75, 100 years is when they don't go past their last revelation, they become stuck. They become stuck. Denominations do that all the time. They have one type of doctrine that they believe. They pass it through to all their churches, through their seminaries and their pastors, and they stick to that belief. Come on, somebody. And then somebody tries to break away and teach something outside of the denomination, and what happens? The bishop shows up, and U-Haul is the next thing you see. Because <laughs> they don't like it. Uh, but anyways, we got to get past that to where revelation breeds revelation. So here we go. Uh, last time, uh, verse 5. I'm going to go over this real quick because I've got so much to teach uh, for tonight. I don't know if I can get through all of it. But verse 5, so let's look at that. Revelation chapter 11, verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire. Everybody say fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So this is incredible power that these two witnesses have. Remember, they're disciplined. They're prophets of God. And God has granted them this supernatural power and this right to do this. Again, as I taught before, I believe the church will have mirror ministries that will be doing these types of things on the earth as a church. Now, I don't believe that we're going to go around with fire out of our mouths. It's not impossible. Uh, I told you something happened to me in Dominican Republic, but there's other testimonies of others throughout the ages that God has done supernatural things with. My point is this, the church's current condition proves we're not ready for fire to come out of our mouth. There wouldn't be any congregation left. <laughs> Help me, Miss Sarah. As soon as you walked in, somebody was in your seat, they'd be a French fry. <laughs> or pastor. <laughs> pastor would look like a burnt marshmallow. Uh, you know, so God isn't going to give us that right and that ability at this juncture. So I don't want anybody leaving or hearing and saying, the pastor at United Church said we're all going to be like the two witnesses. I'm not telling you that. We're going to do mirror ministries as far as what they're going to be doing. I'm not going to be sitting here in Livonia in a bunker watching the two witnesses operate and do nothing. Why be here on the earth? I got a job to do. You have a job to do. So I believe that, again, the wrath of the Lamb, you have to understand this, with the six trumpets and to the seventh trumpet, which is the final one, but through the first six, <clears throat> the wrath of the Lamb is a purifying process, I, I thoroughly believe, is for the church. Yes, it's, it's judgment and it's, it's, it's his wrath and his anger, but it's also uh, a cleansing for the church. And, 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 and you know it as, as we go through these days, the church needs it real bad. Yeah, we really do. We don't need a baptism of water. We need a baptism of fire. Okay, so fire proceeds out of their mouth. We asked, did this happen before? Second Kings 1, 12. We're not going to go there. We know that happened with Elijah <clears throat> calling fire down. Um, I told you about what happened in the Dominican. Uh, remember the timeline. Daniel 9, 27, the covenant is made. The temple is built. Uh, worship starts, and then the two witnesses show up. So we know that the temple is built in the beginning of tribulation, the Daniel 70th week. It begins, it's all part of the covenant. Uh, the way construction is done today wouldn't take them long to build it. In fact, a lot of the materials are already ready. 
and what have you, so it wouldn't be no problem. So that takes place, and then the two witnesses show up. So we want to go back over that timeline. They come at the point where the abomination causes desolation, okay? So they're on the scene, right? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4, I won't have to go over that, but basically the son of perdition is revealed. The, The Antichrist is revealed when he commits this abomination that causes desolation. In other words, the first three years, three and a half years, people are not going to know who the Antichrist is in the totality of who he is. We will because we study the Bible. We will because the Bible gives us specific instructions and descriptions of what the man of sin and lawlessness looks like as far as his characteristics. It's not going to be too hard for us. But because of a strong delusion God gives to the earth, an alien invasion, all kinds of different things that are going to be out there, the Nephilim, just, just supernatural signs and wonders, men are going to be so far back away from God that they, they'll believe a lie. They're just going to believe a lie. <clears throat> at the abomination that causes desolation, at the altar, then the, the mask comes off and he reveals himself as quote unquote, God. Doesn't he do that? He says, I'm God. And he exalts himself against God. And then God says, no, you're not. And then we, we're going to get into that later, okay? We talked about it being Moses. I believe it's Moses and Elijah. There's a lot of scriptural reasons. We're not going to go back over that. Uh, I, think one of the, I think one of the best signs is Matthew 17, at the Mount of Transfiguration, seeing that. And then the, I think the runner-up for, for proving it is that Enoch did no miracles. And all the miracles these two witnesses do fit perfectly Elijah's ministry and Moses' ministry. <clears throat> I also gave you the example of Moses in, as a civil leader and Elijah being what? The prophetic or the religious leader going back to Zechariah chapter 4 with Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest who rebuilt the temple. Two great examples there. Uh, so... <clears throat> if it's, if it's, if it's uh, Enoch, I'll tell him I'm sorry. <laughs> when I see him, I'll say, man, dude, I thought it was Moses. Forgive me, man. You know, <laughs> please don't hit me with any fire. I didn't mean anything at all. I think he'll be cool about it. But uh, what if it turns out to be a guy named Albert and another guy named Larry? You know, be honest with you, theologically, everybody splits hairs. They write books about it. <clears throat> they're adamant of what they believe. We really don't know. We really don't know. There's a lot of things about the book of Revelation that uh, give us types and shadows and symbolisms that lead us to, to certain absolutes. And then there's some things that are shadowy. And we just say, okay. You know, <clears throat> one thing about the Bible you have to learn. When the Bible shouts something, shout it. When the Bible whispers something, when it comes to revelation and truth, whisper it. When the Bible is silent on it, keep your mouth shut. And that's how you learn, and that's how you walk, and you don't get into error, okay? Everybody wants to answer everything. YouTube is full of answers, but it's a dog chasing its tail. I don't have time for it. Okay, I gave you all this information about Elijah uh, living in his earthly body for a thousand years. Can you imagine that? He's been in heaven for a thousand years. I hope he got a bath while he was there. Um... You know, these are just supernatural things. You know, sometimes people don't think about these things. You know what I mean? But Elijah left in whatever outfit he had. I don't think he had a suitcase. And he went to heaven. So I'm sure God took care of him there. But that's interesting. I like those kind of facts. Okay, uh, they had the power to shut up heaven. Let's look at that real quick. Excuse me. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Remember, it doesn't say... that they didn't rain, it says they had the power to stop the rain. So we don't know what scenario it could possibly be. Maybe somebody's running their mouth or whatever, and they just say, oh, really? And they stop the rain. We don't know, okay? But but we know they have the power, and the power over water is a term than the blood. We learned that Moses did that, didn't he? Yeah, he did. He sure did. God gave him the power not only to change the water into blood everywhere there was water sources, but also in the cup of Pharaoh. That's pretty bad, isn't it? <clears throat> and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Again, this is great discipline. This is great power given to these two witnesses. Um, again, I don't think we qualify. 
we can't even walk in the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, we wish our horn was a machine gun when we're in, t- we're in traffic. Wish that our cart was a tank at Walmart because we'd run everybody over, wouldn't we? Okay, so it doesn't, we're not there. So uh, these, these are disciplined folks for sure. <clears throat> so notice it says with, with, with every kind of plague, this is going to be absolutely incredible. Again, go back to the children of Israel, their whole plight and fight to get out of Egypt. Their stay during Egypt, but to get out of Egypt. And look at the book of Revelation. These plagues, these things that are happening are almost exactly the same, aren't they? Okay, so let's go, <clears throat> excuse me, to verse, uh, verse 7. Verse 7. And when they have finished their testimony, this is where I left off last time, but I'm going to go a little deeper into it. When they shall have finished their testimony, everybody say testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay? Look at this. When they have finished their testimony, the word finish in the Greek means to reach a goal or bring it to close, to bring something to close, to reach a goal or to bring something to a close. <clears throat> so think about that for a second. So go back up there and look at it again. Thank you. And when they have reached or finished their testimony or reached the goal, the beast ascended out of the bottomless pit. So what happens here? They finished what God sent them to do. I, I, I want to try to say this and teach it without preaching it. You will finish what God sent you to do. You will finish what God sent you to do. You, you're not going home until you finish what God sent you to do. Everybody needs to hear that. Because in the book of Revelation, we give the devil so much power, so much glory, and so much credit. These two were doing the will of God they were fulfilling the assignment of God and they could not be killed until they reached their goal. That's good gospel news, isn't it? <laughs> so they finished. They reached their goal or they brought it to a close. John 19.30. Go there real quick. John 19.30. When they have finished their testimony. And when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said What? It is finished. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave it to ghost. We know that story. What was finished? His atonement, his work, everything he needed to do. He finished it. He was on the cross. His assignment, his goal was done. Okay? So it's the same understanding. It's actually the same, same uh, definition. All right? So go back to Revelation 11 there. Which beasts are we talking about? We're talking about the Antichrist. Revelation 9-2. Go there real quick. Revelation 9-2. So I'm just capitalizing on last time. So we're, really, we're starting to teach fresh today. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun, and the air was darkened by the reason of the smoke of the pit. Remember, this is that shaft to the abyss, and out of that comes that beast. So go back to verse, uh, chapter 11. So we know that the Antichrist, after he's caused the abomination uh, of desolation on the altar there in Jerusalem, in the new-built new temple, uh, and the, and the two witnesses have done their deal, and they have finished it. This beast comes to make war against them. And what does it say? It says that he overcomes them and kills them. Okay? Here's something again I want you to see. Not only can the devil not do it prematurely, he has to do it at the timing of God. He has to do what he's going to do on the timing of God. He does not have his own schedule. Let me try that again. He doesn't have his own schedule. He doesn't have his own calendar. He doesn't have his own sovereignty. He may have plans that are demonic, but do you know what? Those plans are already written here. Well, I'm telling you, this is powerful. 
It is really powerful when you think about it. What the devil's trying to do to you now, those watching, those dealing with any kind of affliction, any kind of pressure, the devil has to follow the script and he can't go any further. So read him the script. By Jesus' stripes, you were made whole. Come on, though one come against me, I'm going to chase 10,000. Whatever the scripture is, whatever the situation is, you put the word to it. Okay, I just I wanted to throw that out there because these guys are preaching. They are doing what they want to do for three and a half years under the authority of God while the so-called devil, the Antichrist, the lawless one, the son of perdition, the beast, the false prophet, the whole system is on earth operating through the wickedness of men. God is still having his way. I love it. So let's go to the next verse. And their dead bodies, they're dead, shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So some people try to spiritualize all that, and they say, well, I think it means this, it means that. It's Jerusalem. Where was Jesus crucified? In Jerusalem, in Golgotha. Why is it called spiritually Sodom and Egypt? Because of the homosexuality. Because of the perversion, because of the idol worship, because of the paganism and the orgies and everything else that has taken place over the centuries in there and what is taking place today. Tel Aviv at one time, I don't know if anymore, was the homosexual capital of the world. Israel is very dirty, very dirty when it comes to the secular side of Israel. No different than the United States and pornography and on and on it goes. And I know that busts some Christians' bubbles, but study. It is what it is. And God says, hey, you are just like Sodom, and you're just like Egypt. Okay? It's a place of great rebellion. And, and you find that amazing, even though it has so many wonderful things to it, and it's going to be the city of the great king, and Jesus is coming there, and he still loves it, and is the apple of his eyes, all those different things. The understanding is this. It is, it's, it's that place that he's going to deal with for their sin. It's very simple. Okay, so a lot of people try to spiritualize it. So let's look at it again. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So imagine this thing. Imagine, here are these two witnesses. They're, they're doing what they're doing. All these signs and wonders and all these miracles are taking place. And then all of a sudden, after three and a half year mark, they're dead and they're lying in the streets. Now let me show you something real quick about lying in the streets. First of all, uh, and I'm going to go back to showing you about Jerusalem being Sodom so, so you would know this. But they didn't even get a burial. What an insult it is. And, and, and what's amazing is if you know anything about Israeli customs and what happens over in Israel, when anybody... Is, is involved in, let's say, a car bombing or any type of death, every piece of that body, and I'm not trying to be gross, I'm telling you their view of life is picked up and put together and put in a bag, including all the blood is soaked up and put into special bags for the burial because every part of that body represents life. I'm telling you this because this is such an insult to leave their bodies for three days not even the Muslims would do this. And we wouldn't do it in the West. So there's something, and I'm going to show you to you in a few minutes, that absolutely put people into a place where they were just so relieved to get rid of them. Could you imagine? I couldn't imagine that. Three days, three and a half days uh, or so. We'll get into the details about it. Uh, Jerusalem as Sodom, I wanted you to go back to that. You can look it up. Isaiah 1, 9 through 10 speaks towards that. Ezekiel 16, 46. Luke 17, 26 through 30. All of these represent the sin, uh, the things that, that uh, uh, Jerusalem was going through at the time and definitely will uh, do as well. So let's go. Verse 9. <clears throat> so we know it's, it, it's, it's Jerusalem. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. How are they going to do that? Anybody ever heard of CNN? 
Fox News, Christian television, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, I mean, iPhone, <laughs> Galaxy, you name it. They're going to see this. Everybody in the world, so think about this with me. Here's the two witnesses, they're, they're dead. They're on the streets of Jerusalem, three and a half days, and the whole world sees it. They're going to film this thing. They are literally going to film. This is going to be breaking news. You, you, ever, you ever seen, oh, I don't know, we can use O.J. Simpson as an example with the slow chase. Everybody was riveted to the TV. Remember that? Watching that Bronco. 56 miles an hour. Remember that? I was. 9-11, loop after loop. You know, we, we get glued to it, and they, 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 just, they just throw this stuff at us. Well, you picture this. Here they are. They got the camera. You know? Hi, I'm Bob Costa. Here's, uh, I don't know if he's going to be here or not, but, you know, here's uh, the two guys. Still not moving. Still dead. You know? <laughs> Whatever. You, can you picture it? Back, back in the day when this was first preached and technology wasn't there, our forefathers didn't understand this. What do you compare it to? Today, we're like, yeah. Yeah, I can watch an eagle having a baby in Montana, and I can live in Bangkok. You know, it's amazing how that. So we can see that happening. So they see their dead for three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead to be put in the graves. I mean, they just totally root them out. They totally break all customs and manners, uh, humanity, uh, sanitary. Oh, I'm sure there's going to be no flies. Come on, use your imagination. I'm sure there's going to be no buzzards. Give me a break. They're just going to lay there in the sun. You know what? They must have done something to really make somebody really mad. Don't you think? Again, it's really ironic to me that the Israelis, uh, they do that. They collect every piece of the flesh because life means so much but then they won't do this for these two prophets. So three and a half days, three and a half days. Why do you think it's three and a half days? This is conjecture. It's not gonna make a difference theologically as far as eternity, but, but I believe the three and a half years, or three and a half days represents the three and a half years that they just said, you know what? We can't leave you for three and a half years here, but we're just going to memorialize this moment and celebrate for three and a half days because of what you guys did. Now watch this. Let's prove that to you. Verse 10. It, it's a nice, it's, 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 a, it's a thought. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. Who? Everybody in the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and send gifts one to another. It's literally Christmas. Christmas has come to the world because of these two Prophets are dead. Now, let me, let me ask you this. Now, a lot of people celebrate pastors dying and, you know, getting to shut up, I'm sure. But the whole world? There must have been something going on, and we're going to see it in a minute, that caused the whole world to have a party. I can't even fathom people rejoicing over the death of two people. First of all, we don't know how the beast kills them. I mean, does he execute them? I don't know what he does. But obviously, it's done for the world to see, and everybody's like, yeah, amazing. Do you see the flip of the world? You know, it's bad now, but think how bad it's going to be. And we're, just, we're here talking about all of these things prior that taken place with the seals, with the trumpets, and we still have man this way? We still have humanity that is this darkened? Unbelievable, but yes, it gets worse. That's why when I tell you it gets going to get worse, it's going to get worse. And we have to learn to buck underneath it. Okay, so it's going to be just like Christmas. Wow, I'm, I'm, the, I'm blown away by that. Okay, so they shall send gifts one to the What do you send somebody through Amazon? You know, a photo of them getting killed. What do you, what do, you do? Anyways, I guess you do something. Because these two prophets... Underline this in your notes, in your Bible. Tormented them that dwell on the earth. Why, pastor? Why did they break 
all ethics and just, you know, common sense and common decency because these guys tormented the earth. What do you mean by tormented? It means, watch this, it means it convicted them. That's why a lot of people don't like Holy Ghost preachers because you get convicted. Okay? And then you say, oh, you're hurting me. You're hurting my emotions. You're hurting everything about me. No, we're not. We're trying to get you saved. Watch this. It means to rub, but it also means to torture. How many of y'all remember when you were running from God and the guy would preach and it would just rip you apart and it was like torture until you finally made the decision? I'm raising my hand and my leg. I mean, I did it. Hear that guy preaching about hell or whatever it was and I just couldn't get out of my seat. I wouldn't get out of my seat. I had to shut him off or I'd leave or whatever. That type of torture, that, that's exactly what this Greek word means. Please hear what I'm telling you. These two prophets are not Joel Osteen type of characters, okay? Your best life now kind of guys. They're not going to torment the earth because they're talking about prosperity. They're going to torment the earth because they're preaching about the sin. Stuff is going to be going on in the world. All of the paganism and pornography, all the lasciviousness and drug addictions, everything is going to be at full tilt. And they are going to preach as hard as they possibly can. Why? This is the last call. I'm reading to you the rapture chapter, by the way, and I've already taught this so many different times, but this is the rapture chapter, those who remember. This is where it happens. And God is bringing out the big guns. He's bringing out the best. And these two, including the remnant, the church, are the best that were left for last. Didn't he say he always saves the best for last? He sure has, and he sure will. And that's us who are going to be here during that time. So it means to rub and to torture. Let me tell you something else it means. You go look it up in the Greek. It's all these words are, are there. It means to be a touchstone. What is a touchstone? A touchstone is used to rub against a specific material to find out whether it's gold or silver. It rubs, it rubs, it rubs, it rubs, it rubs until it gets all of that decay and fakeness off to see underneath is it real or not. So the, the Greek word means they're going to rub, rub, and rub, and rub you raw. Because they're not going to shut up. They're not going to take a praise break. They're not going to have an infomercial for their latest book. They're not going to fashion wear their sackcloth and ashes. Very nice. You know, they're not going to do anything like that. They're not going to be the QVC or whatever it's called. They are going to preach, 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 preach. 24-7, 365. The world will see it. I don't know how they're sustained. I don't have all the details. I don't know if they got a hotel. I don't know none of that. But we just know that through scripture and, and translation, they are going to rub everybody raw. I like them. <laughs> I like those guys. Why? Why would God do that? Because it's the end. It's coming to the end. And he is about to pour his wrath out when there's no escape. And he wants nobody to perish. Can you see now why they didn't want to bury him? They were literally worn out by hearing these two guys preach holiness, righteousness, the crucifixion, the resurrection. Holiness, righteousness, the crucifixion, the resurrection, repentance. And on and on it goes. And they were tired of hearing them. They will rub the world, write this down, with truth. That's why people don't like preachers who preach truth. Can you please give us a softball once in a while? Can you? Can you just tell us how sweet we are? We just whisper it here. No. No, because you have a Bible full of whispers. You have a Bible full of kisses, butterfly kisses. You have, a, you have enough psalms to see how much God loves you. This is not a time for butterfly kisses. This is a time for, hey, here, wake up. Wake up, here's the deal, man. Here's the deal, God loves you, but guess what? Time's running out. I'll speak to the Christian now. To those that are backslidden, those that are lost, you know, it's a message of hope and grace. Okay? Is that cool? All right, so that was, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still in this, this chapter here, but I, I'm just going now to part four in, in my other notes. 
So we're going to move along with that. Is that all right? So th- this, is, this is incredible. These guys are preaching. And, and again, I sit there and I say, okay, God, we're not ready to even see these miracles as, as people, as Christians. It's even worse for the pastors. They ain't ready to preach like that. Because they don't now. They don't now because they're too busy in their sin. Come back Sunday, we'll talk about it. Watch this, verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of Zoe, the spirit of life, the pneuma of Zoe, the, the, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw, saw them. Wouldn't you say so? Think about it. It's not, <laughs> let me get up. <laughs> I mean, they went, whoop. You're sitting there rejoicing. You're having barbecue. Yeah, these guys are dead. Yeah. <laughs> you choke on your chicken or whatever. And they rose. Imagine that. Watch the CNN, Fox News. It don't matter. I'm trying to put some humor to it. Because, but, but use your imagination. The spirit of life, the spirit of God came in them and whoop, they're back to life. I can't explain to you medically, decomposing. I can't explain any of that to you. I've been around bodies uh, dead for a long time, short time. I can't explain. But all I can tell you is this. When God gets involved, them bones will live, won't they? They will live. Somebody says, I know. Every morning when I get up, I say, oh, Lord, think these bones are living. (laughs) (laughs) Crick, 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 crick. Oh, hey, this is biblical. All right. After three days and a half, he enters him. <clears throat> they stand upon their feet and great fear, great fear. Think about this, great fear. I, I would think so. I would think so. But watch this. Mega fear is what the word is in the Greek, mega or megosphere. We know it's just mega fear. But, but fear, this is what it means. It means to descend from a higher place to a lower place like a blanket. In other words, they raise from the dead And like a holy reverence, it falls on those who see it. It's not one where you can shake it off. If I threw a blanket on you, where are you going to go? It's going to be on you, right? That's what this means. The whole atmosphere changes from a party celebration to great fear and great all in wonder. So imagine that, okay? This is not a goosebump. This is a holy fear you can't shake. So, they're dead. Now they're alive. A tremendous miracle takes place. Now, I want to say this to you, and this is probably a good point, a good part to say it. <clears throat> when you look at the book of Revelation, especially chapter 11, I'm reading to you as though it's a crossword puzzle and there's still words to be put in. Or another way I was thinking about it today was, you know how sometimes the government will send out uh, you know, uh, JFK, uh, secret documents, whatever, and things are redacted, or FBI redacted things. You can read the sentence and you can only imagine what is in there. Think about it this way. The book of Revelation is going, especially chapter 11, is going through some speedily things, speed, very fast things. And there are redacted things on purpose that the other chapters are going to answer. This is why it's hard to study the book of Revelation sometimes, and some guys get it wrong, gals get it wrong, because they try to go chronological with it, and then they, they put conjecture, and they think it means this or that. When you look at this, and I tell you this is a rapture chapter, and I show you these proofs of it, there's other things that are redacted that are put in there that are explained in chapter 13. It's chapter 13 explains the mark of the beast. Right? It does, and we'll get to it. And other chapters explain what's happening. So I wanted you to see that. It's like I told you in the beginning. As I teach you line upon line the book of Revelation, you can't forget Daniel's 70th week. You can't forget that goes into that whole puzzle. Does that make sense? So when I read these next, or teach these next few points to you, please understand that, that it all comes together perfectly. <clears throat> and the other thing you must write down in your notes is that there's, there's codes, there's certain words, you know, like search words? There's a certain words that are used in the teaching of Revelation that if you grab hold of it and chase it down, it brings you to the connection of what it means. 
It's a word search, but it becomes a word connection. Does that make sense? So you have to, you have to be very careful when you study the book of Revelation, and, but, but it's, it's possible. That's why he put it there, and he wants you to study it that way. Okay, so who saw them? The whole world saw them. Next verse. <clears throat> so that means everybody in the world was fearful. And they heard a great ver- voice from sa- heaven saying unto them, who heard it? I believe everybody hears it. I don't think it's just the two witnesses. I think if God is going to raise him from the dead and allow CNN, look, and Fox News, God doesn't let a, a, a thing like that go to waste. He's going to be like, oh, you want the camera on me? Okay, here we go. He's going to show off, okay? That's just him. He wants to show the world. So they heard a great voice. If raising them from the dead wasn't enough, now you hear a great voice from heaven saying unto them, come up hither, come up hither, come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. Remember cloud. When I taught you about the rapture, uh, which this is not the rapture, this is a resurrection. This is a type of rapture for them. This is an ascension for them. This is a resurrection, and then this is an ascension. But remember I told you about the cloud. Always to look for the cloud, because we're dealing with what? The parousia, the appearance of Christ. Again, you have to go back to that teaching to get the whole detail of Monte on that. But I just, those are little buzzwords, a little key words to watch. Up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies beheld them. This is the same analogy of Jesus ascending into heaven in the cloud, right? With the disciples looking. And then there's the angels, and the angels explain, hey, what are you looking up for, you know? They had the same, same way he went, the same way he's coming down. So we're going to be looking for the cloud ourselves. Is that right? That's right. So the whole world sees this. You know what's incredible about this? Not only did they not repent for the three and a half years of preaching, not only did they repent when they saw them resurrected, not only did they repent when they heard a great voice, which is God's voice, not only did they repent then, they saw him go in the cloud. And they're still going to follow the Antichrist. They're still going to take the mark of the beast. They're still going to follow the wicked one, the lawless one, the son of perdition. That's how jacked up, messed up, twisted man will be. And man ain't far from that now. Man is not far from that now. Okay? And God's going to help him with the delusion. Next verse. In the same hour. Everybody say the same hour. Not another day. Same hour. There was a great earthquake or megas earthquake. And a tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000. Pretty big earthquake, wasn't it? Pretty big earthquake. So we have them coming up hither. They send it to a cloud. Let me give you a couple scriptures to back that. Luke 21, 25 through 28. Matthew 24, 29 through 31. And Revelation 1, 7. Just so you have that. So the great earthquake takes place and 7,000 people die. And yet, that ain't enough to get people to repent. Not all, because watch what happens here. And the tenth part of the city fell. What city? Jerusalem. And then the earthquake were slain of men, 7,000. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. So in that remnant of people that were there, finally some people give glory to God and they recognize, "Uh uh-oh, we just made a mistake. Uh Uh-oh, these guys were telling the truth. Doesn't say the world It just says a remnant, okay? Now, let's go to where we at. The next verse, trying to see my time. Got a clock that works, all right? The second woe is past. Put that in your head. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Here's the key word, a search word, quickly. Quickly, quickly. The second woe is past. Coming up to the six trumpets, waiting on the seventh trumpet, which is the kickoff to what? The third woe. Is that right? Absolutely. So we have this resurrection. We have an ascension of the two witnesses. Okay? Again, all these other things are happening. The beast system, the mark, all the stuff is going on. So don't lose sight of that. All right? Again, quickly is a code word. It has the connections. But second woe has passed. Verse 15.
And what, what, what number is that? The seventh angel sounded. Are we looking for the last trumpet? You found it. You found it. This destroys the pre-tribulation doctrine of verse, chapter 4, verse 1 of come up hither. That's where they believe the rapture is, and it is not. There's too much to go over that. I've already done that. It's not. You're waiting for what? The seventh trumpet, the final trumpet. After this verse right here, there are no more trumpets. You can't find another trumpet in the book of Revelation. That means I am to be looking for the last trumpet. Is that right? As long as we're on the same page. If we're going to be scripturally accurate. All right. So the seventh angel sounded and there was a great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become. Everybody say become. They become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. So at the final trumpet, right, an announcement's made. What is the announcement to be made? His kingdom has come. It is finished. The goal has been completed. I'll give you another example. Uh, Revelation 10, 6 through 7. Watch this. Now Revelation 10, 6 through 7 is parenthetical. Some people say, well, that's where it's at. That's where rapture is. Well, parenthetically, it's thrown in there. But in actuality, in chronological order, it's in chapter 11. So if you ever heard somebody say 10, uh, it's okay. But it's not it's not in the order you want it to be. Revelation 10, 6 through 7. Revelation chapter 10, 6 through 7. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things where, which are therein, and that there should be time no longer. Remember I told you, time no longer. Time no longer was very important, okay? Because it wasn't talking about linear time. It wasn't talking about chronos. Chronos is the tick and talk on your watch. Kairos is what happens between the tick and the talk, the supernatural seasons of God. You can't control the kairos. You can barely control the chronos. Next verse. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, so it's parenthetical, it's telling you what's to come, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Okay, I taught that last time in chapter 10. What is the mystery? The gospel. Can't go back over it. It's too much teaching. The gospel is the mystery that was hidden in the Old Testament. It was concealed in the New Testament. It's revealed. Is that right? Absolutely. We don't, we don't know that until we got to the New Testament. So we can't sit there and look at the Old Testament people and say, we're smarter than you. <laughs> they didn't have what we have. You know, we were given a gift. And we ought to be thankful for it. Okay? So now go back to Revelation eleven fifteen. So that was parenthetical. So in, in theory, okay, that's, that's that, that verse and you can see the trumpet. But in actuality, chronologically, it's right here. Everybody in the same chapter, same verse with me? Okay? So it's a completion, and to prove that, listen to the announcement one more time. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So he finishes, basically, he finishes the church age. He finishes what's happening, the whole mystery, and now he's about to release his wrath. Now it's, it's virtually over as we get into. We'll, we'll have some uh, redacted, you know, connections and stuff in the next verses that lead to the end. And we'll see a big picture. But for the most part, he's done. He's done with, he, the church has done its job. The church has preached. I sent you the cream of the crop with the two witnesses. I left behind a remnant. All these different things. And I'm going to deal with you now. Okay? So they, uh, I wrote this down. Chapter 11 does not contain all the details. It is a snapshot of events. So remember that. It's a snapshot. Two witnesses finished their assignment, and so do we. Uh, let me run through these scriptures. Thank you. Let me run through these scriptures, and let me put these together for you. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. Let's read those together. 
Again, those who have sat underneath this teaching for the rapture and end times, I really don't have to reteach it to you, but I want to, for context, for you to see this. For this uh, we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So we don't go before the dead, is that right? So keep this in memory. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of what? An archangel, and with what? The trump of, of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Next verse. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in where? Clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now go to 1 Corinthians 16.51. Yeah, comfort each other with these words. I always say scare everybody with them. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 16.51. Joshua's doing a good job, man. That's hard back there. Thank you, buddy. I'd have the weather channel up or something. I'd be so messed up. 1 Corinthians 16.51. Oh, 1551, 1551. Okay, I gave you the wrong scripture then. Okay, so let's back away from that. I'll get that back to you. No, 51, you got 15? There's no 51? No 1551? Okay, I gave you the wrong scripture. I'll get that for you. But basically, you know the, the scripture that speaks about the last trump, Right? The last trump of God. Again, go back to Revelation 11. What's that? Let's see what you got. Yeah, that's what I said, 1551. I actually said 1651. Then I went to 1551, and then she said there's no 1551. But I was right. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all... I was right, yay! Balloons, ukuleles, or gazoos. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. What's going to happen? Next verse. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Everybody say, last trump. It's not Donald. Sorry. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, incorruptible, and above all, or we shall be changed, right? So let's go to Revelation 11. I knew it was 15. I had, I had it wrong on my, on my, my paper here. So are we back there? Here we go. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven saying, The kings of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and we shall reign forever and forever. So we're looking for the last trump, right? Bam, there it is, verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. Notice in the book of Revelation there, chapter 11, what do we do? We start out with the temple natural, right? Verse 1. Now we're in heaven in the new temple, or the temple that's there. I should say new, but we're now in a new scene. So we're, we've left the earth, we've left that scene, and now we're seeing what's going on in heaven. The seventh angel trumpets, the beginning of the third woe is coming, the scene changes. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of Christ forever and ever. And now the 24 elders are plastered on the floor. What a church service. Can somebody say amen? And you want to hear something really cool? This is really, really cool. I'll see you next Wednesday and I'll tell you. We got to go. I can't go any further. Uh, <laughs> that was good. That was wee. No, I'm going to stop right there because there's, there's too much I want to talk to you about this. There, there's some translation uh, corrections that I want to give to you that King James doesn't really give in these next couple verses here and his next couple scenes that I really want to share. It's going to make a difference for you. But to, to, to cap it all up, two witnesses, man, two great prophets preaching, rubbing people raw for the what? The sake of their souls, the sake of salvation, the church is going to be on fire. The church is going to be preaching powerful Holy Ghost messages, whether it's underground, above ground, wherever it may be, we'll be the remnant church preaching for the last days because this is the end. It's coming to the end, and God wants everybody to be born again, and he'll do whatever it takes for that to happen. So next time we get together, we're going to go more into the scene of heaven 
and, and catch the next couple verses on that and get into more detail. Father, thank you for this opportunity to minister. Uh, we're excited. We know that day's coming, but we know there's a long road that's ahead of us on this Revelation road. But I'm glad you've already gone before us and you paved it with truth and you're giving us faith to make the journey. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, I love you. I'll see you Sunday morning.